In the 43 years since its inception, the black Muslim movement in the United States has undergone radical and sometimes violent changes, and it's had its share of internal dissension, as witnessed by the breakaway Hanafi faction. Randy Daniels has a report. The roots of Islam are deep in the American black community. The movement began in the 1930s when Elijah Muhammad, known then as Elijah Poole, left the dusty auto assembly line to spread the meaning of Islam. He sought to lead what he called a lost people. He called himself the messenger of Allah and wanted to bring them under the crescent that symbolizes the Muslim faith. But unity was something Elijah's nation of Islam found difficult to achieve. Malcolm X, the fiery Muslim minister who gained prominence in the 1960s, was assassinated by Muslim gunmen in New York after breaking with Elijah. Malcolm X had fundamental differences with Elijah over the interpretation of Islamic scripture, often attacking him in public as a man obsessed with wealth and power. The story of the Hanafi Muslims is much the same. Hamas Khalis, the Hanafi leader who is spearheading the Washington takeover, was once a strong backer of Elijah Muhammad. In the early 1960s, he also broke away, calling Elijah a false prophet. In 1972, Khalis wrote a letter attacking Elijah and the Nation of Islam. He sent copies to members of the black Muslims. In 1973, a band of Philadelphia Muslims stormed this Washington house where the Hanafi sect is headquartered. They fatally shot two adults and one child. They drowned four other children. The Nation of Islam denies taking any part in the murders, but the Hanafi Muslims, who number about 1,000, believe the Nation of Islam was involved and want revenge. We're dealing with brutal murders. A baby nine days old. Most people are afraid to hold a baby that young. But here you got somebody that took that baby in their arms and drowned it. Khalifa Hamas Abdul Khalis lost his nine day old to 22 months and his daughters, you know, six times shot in the head. These is fiends, man. So it ain't so much about getting individuals. We talking about getting the, the, the essence of that product that would do that. Wallace Mohammed, who succeeded his father as leader of the black Muslims, Dear said beloved, that he has no knowledge of the murders other than press reports. The Hanafis believe in a very literal interpretation of the Muslim holy book, the Quran. They have had a running feud with the larger, better known black Muslims for this reason. They say the building seizures in Washington are to secure peace, but so far they have managed only violence. Randy Daniels, CBS News, Chicago. That house in Washington that the Hanafi sect uses as its headquarters was given them by pro basketball player Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The other sports figure involved in this drama, boxing champion Muhammad Ali, was in Los Angeles today. Yo, son, get the vest, get the vest. Hold up, grab your knives. Crazy hacked it out here, God. Ice cold, it's the round, see the crowd. Got the guard, you nations out. Fuck up. Blast that nigga hard. Wow. Season. The love is guilty of high treason Many of them bleeding Some getting sent to the grave for no reason On the streets, niggas kill without a license As far as feel, we so for real Cause everything is real Don't sleep on the average cat, he's hey, back to steal I want the cash rolls, wait in my hand Half a hundred grand, injured at pretender in the black land Heard he be the crack man, selling major jumps by the page son He the one sporting crazy tools, lace away your ton So here's the plan, get the clock, I got the oo-wop Follow him for two blocks, and pop him if he do Cock his gap back, better snap his nap back for that black. Pass the stacks the fat cat and find out where the cracks at. Bone out, make sure you keep your phone out so I can reach your shit quick. Get his whip strip and take my own route for safety. Mistakes be for hasty. Maybe Jake should chase me, but never have the space to embrace me. Your fool's game, all the rules change. I never move the same, but who's to blame? My nigga Buddha came with the Ruger aim. Somebody scream, stop the balancer. This nigga had the silencer. Spitting black talents and it's a challenge. It. Yo, it was a ghetto being on my side to flee and harm me and harm. My nigga boot a court about three in the arm With one travel to was abdomen I grabbed him and embraced him Had to see a baddest crab and laced him Yeah, rapidly bleeding, started bleeding for his life Take him, I see them, my wife Make sure she's feeding him right To indeed black, I got your back I hold it down on the real May you rest in peace, son I see you on the ground yeah, it's burning season Your thugs is guilty of high treason Many of them bleeding So getting sent to the grave for no reason On the streets, niggas kill without a license As far as build, it's so for real Cause everything is Real. No sleep on the average yeah. cat, he's back in the Many times I fought the urge to resort to crime But I find my 
criminal mind Combined with the villain kind I'm feeling nice Till they overflow Going with blow for blow with the rest Cause them giant tests the best It's a slug cat Round one sounds wrong I found one Lurking in the back Loud clap The woman bounce on the shells drop Old lady sell for the cops Shorty shot shit Fell in the arms of his pops I didn't mean to Why he had to run in the way Should've taught him how to duck When he heard a fucking gun spray I say you're praying for the kid Keep stepping with my weapon cop Wetting up the block Every section hot The gas flash out My leaps and bounds Now police and hounds Making the grounds Cause they're chasing me down I'm all alone in this war zone My brain torn I'm stressed Thinking I'm blessed If I can make it home Scared to death Can't catch my breath I bare left Hit the wheeze and then rest To call my chest But an undercover Had discovered my plot And plan I shot the man So I dropped my clock and ran Get the fuck out the way Move Yeah, I made a rally to a dark alley Where I bump beds with crackhead Fred and this bitch named Sally She had a down low laugh for me to go to Where I could relax and count stacks like I'm supposed to Keep my whereabouts on the hush hush I had to provide some heroin high See rules and five bags of dust I didn't wet it but let it slide because I was petrified If I'm a side got me, they gonna watch me die Fuck that, I'm going all out, no half stepping My last weapon is cock to keep that ass jetting I lay low for like five days or so Put some troopers on the block Round the clock to make me go Yo, out of sight and out of mind be my motto I promise myself that I'ma make it to see tomorrow Yo, burning season, your gloves is guilty of high treason Many of them bleeding, some getting sent to the grave for no reason On the streets, niggas still without a license That's God's bill, it's all for real Cause everything is real, no sleep on the average Scat, it's back in jail Prince, the saga continues. Real though, gotta let these niggas know. It's in the rounds in the cut. Real niggas race. Terrorism television. Each new episode of kidnapping or hijacking seems to reinforce that link, raising questions about the role of the media in these nerve wracking incidents. After last week's siege of Washington by a group of Hanafi Muslims holding well over 100 hostages, no less a source than the UN ambassador, Andrew Young, called it an example of glorifying and advertising these kinds of events. Newsmen call it covering the story. But when violent people are playing to the camera, there's no question that the medium itself can become a kind of hostage, and the reporter has to dodge and struggle to keep from being captured and used. That was the spot a Washington newsman named Max Robinson found himself in last week. As anchorman at television station WTOP, he was in the middle of that story that held the country's attention. It was an act of terrorism so broad, so bizarre, so many lives at stake, that it brought the nation's capital to a standstill. After the murder of one man and the wounding of many others, the terrorists held three buildings and 134 hostages at gunpoint. Police vainly tried to set up some channel of communication with them. But this is an age of media consciousness, of politics by public terror and the terrorists insisted on an audience for their negotiations. The only channel they would accept was the media. The man they wanted to communicate through was Mac Robinson. For the last two years, the face and voice of WTOP 6 and 11 p.m. newscasts, the broadcasts with the biggest local audience. The terrorists established a telephone dialogue with Robinson, who was the first to broadcast their demands. Among other things, that a new movie about the Prophet Muhammad be banned because they found it offensive. But once the film is removed from this country, once you are asking that those responsible for the deaths or who killed your children be brought to the B'nai B'rith building. And the ones that kill Malcolm. And the ones that kill Malcolm. That's right. I want them. And you're asking for the $750? I want them. And the $750. And be sure you make on the radio that I've turned down millions of dollars, so it's not the 750 but this dog-ass Judge Braben. He hold me in contempt of court because I charged the murderers that murder my babies. Now, what do you think about that? And you think I'm going to roll over and play dead? What do you think I am? Some kind of jokester? I take my face serious. At 37, Robinson is a 12-year veteran of the news business. A college dropout, an Air Force man who went home to Virginia and started pounding on newsroom doors, unsuccessfully, until things started opening up for blacks in Washington. As a TV reporter around town, he had covered some big local stories, some other Muslim stories. 
His professional judgment, he says, had never been so critically tested. When I had one, had to sell that. You think I went through all that as a joke, Max? Do you? I understand what you're saying. All right, saying. then. After the, you have made faith. those, you have what made about the... those sharpshooters, uh, brother? Uh, they may have moved them somewhere else. Keep stacking, boys. Keep stacking, boys. Move it faster. Make them move faster, Latif. Work them. Hamas? Yes. You talked to Police Chief Cullinane a few moments ago. Yes. What were your demands of him? Same thing, Max. I'm through. All right? Been talking all day. Okay? Thank you, sir. All right. In terms of understanding what you're covering, in terms of the sensitivity of what you're covering, you're talking about emotional sensitivity. It's a little different from sensitivity for facts. You can get the facts. Uh, all of us get the facts. That's a very important part of the business. In my struggle to be a good journalist, I have no fear of having that kind of sensitivity. But I recognize that the danger is that you can go overboard and become a participant, become an advocate. Uh, I think the only reason that I have been called a participant or that I was involved or in the middle, as has been said and many expressions have been used, was simply because I got it first and I got an understanding of it. That's all. If we have to air, ready, boys, over. By his direct contact on the air with the kidnappers, Robinson was already walking a thin line between reporter and messenger, between observer and participant. Now, a telephone call he was about to receive could push him over the line and into the story he was covering. Ready? Hello? Okay, <laughs> Hello. Hi. This is Max Rodman. Mark, please. Yes? What did I say? What did I say? I said that. We will. I said that on the air. Call us on 6136 as she uh, talks to us. You got a lot of time in sports. Just let Max do this. I'll let Gordon do this. What did I say about Malcolm? Hi. Can I, uh, Would you tell me what I said? I can't. How can I straighten it up if you don't tell me what it was? Oh, they're going to kidnap me. What? I'm going to be kidnapped by the Anonymous. Let me have Gordon on the phone. Let's get back to work. With a wife and four children at home, Robinson didn't take the threat lightly, but it didn't change his approach to the story. He went back to his anchor position without visibly missing a beat. Gordon Barnes, we've had uh, pretty good weather for the past week or, or so, or the past four or five days. Mm -hmm. Today wasn't uh, the, yeah, wasn't the as greatest. good as I expected. We have uh, some high clouds this afternoon. Which is beginning of the weekend. Although the audience remained unaware of the threat, news director Jim Snyder and his staff were concerned. They felt this was not just another crank call. Thank you. The guy sounds like he might be one of those folks. Yeah. They've taken three buildings. It would not be too difficult for them to take me, I would assume. You know, you take three buildings, you can sure take a little reporter. And they say they're going to take me, meaning kidnap. <laughs> now, what have we done in terms of dealing with uh, making that a little more difficult than it is right now? I'm telling you that he sounds like some of the Anafis that I've run across. I am. Right. Well, we have security here in the building. You can stay here in the you building. You mean our regular security? <laughs> Holy we, hell, it's all awesome. We, 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 we do have uh, about three uniformed policemen downstairs. Have you informed the police? And indeed, two district policemen were brought in for Robinson's round-the-clock protection until the announcement that the hostages were finally released. The ordeal of the entire city has ended. The ordeal of the hostages the ordeal of those people who worked long hours. In fact, all of the people, the officials, who were involved for the past 39 hours in dealing with a situation the likes of which the nation's capital has never seen before. This story's not over, but certainly the, the dramatic part, the part that held this town on edge for 39, 40 some hours, that part is over. You can feel the relief, you can feel a sigh in, in the nation's capital uh, this morning. All of us feel. I think 
journalists are the last to feel it. Last week in Washington, it was Max Robinson. Next week, it could be, as Walter Cronkite talked about in an interview, some other reporter, anywhere. Since the terrorists seem to be getting better at handling us, are we getting any better at handling them? Well, I don't know that we are. I suppose uh, experience always counts for something, so maybe we are getting better. I don't know really, though, what we could or should do about this, uh, Dan. It seems to me that we cannot control the events that need to be reported. All we can do is be responsible in reporting the events that occur. Do you think it's fair criticism to say that we provoke the terrorists? I think that it's something that is, is within the range of possibility. I don't think it can be dismissed quickly, but I don't see where that uh, really uh, counts on how we handle the story. I don't think we can suppress stories like this. What about Ambassador Andrew Young Sunday said he wished, quote, there could be a law that would restrict the publication of information regarding violent crime. Now, could the First Amendment stand such a law? No, couldn't at all, in no way. The First Amendment says there shall be no law which infringes on the freedom of speech and press. In your judgment, what can we say to those people who continually say to us, listen, we cannot allow this to happen and keep happening and escalate each time, that those of you in the media have to do something? The, 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 I don't know how this society got so media-oriented in blaming the messenger for everything that transpires in our society and for all of its ills. We are only the messenger. It's other aspects of society which have to take action. Speedier justice, better forms of justice perhaps, a uh, better way to treat uh, those who uh, have uh, just or unjust claims against society. Uh, we have to report it. With television's instantaneous coverage and the resulting instantaneous <laughs> decisions of what we cover, what is aired, how we air it, do we have enough time in television to contemplate the consequences of what we do? I'm not sure we should be concerned about the consequences of what we do. Those are strong words, I know, and they're, they, they're, in, they're inclined to come back to haunt one because I've said them before, and I know what the dangers of it of that statement uh, can be. You know, a lot of people are going to say, well, Mr. Cronkite, you've got to worry about the consequences. That's right. But, but you see, when we start worrying about the consequences, we're beginning to, beginning to play another role other than that of reporters. We're beginning to play a judgmental role. We're beginning to play God. And I don't think I'm equipped to do that. I'm not sure I know any journalist who is. A woman from the PTA or a businessman down the street says to you, Mr. Cronkite, why wouldn't you be in favor of a complete and total blackout once something like this happens? What's your answer? Because that's not serving the public's best interests at all. All that does is lead to rumor and speculation, to doubt that the press is telling the whole story under any circumstances. And that's the most important consideration of all. If we cover up stories under any circumstance, the public has every right to believe that we cover them up under any circumstance. And if we cover up at all, then the whole belief, rely, reliance upon the press is gone. Last question. This whole subject scares the hell out of me, does it you? Yes, it does. Sure. It's, it's, uh, I think it's a uh, very, very serious problem for all of us. And uh, we needn't go into here, the permutations of it. But I think that's why you're scared. That's why I'm scared. We all know that they're there. Forty years now since the Nafi siege, when terrorists attacked three buildings in the district. Two people were killed in that event. More than 100 hostages were taken. Well, Mark Seagraves has a look back at that dark day in the city's history. March 9th, 1977. Terrorists struck the nation's capital when a group of Hanafi Muslims led by Hamas Abdul Khalis You know damn well what went down took 149 hostages at three locations in northwest D.C. The B'nai B'rith offices, the Islamic Center on Massachusetts Avenue, and the District Building on Pennsylvania Avenue. That's where then Councilmember Marion Barry was shot in the chest. Reporter Maurice Williams was shot and killed, and security guard Matt Cantrell was also shot. Cantrell died days later of a heart attack. 
And you could see very clearly through the openings, people were being beaten. Paul Green was one of those hostages. He spoke to News 4 in 2012. I was lying in my own pool of blood. Other colleagues had been shot, stabbed, and beaten. And at one point in the very beginning, 50 of us were piled on top of each other. And that's what started my day. The siege lasted nearly two days until a peaceful surrender was reached. Hello, I'm Jim Vance, and we're on the air right now because it is over. Maurice Cullinane was chief of police at the time. He led the negotiating team trying to convince the leader, Hamas Abdul Khalis, to free the hostages. I was yelling up and down the steps talking to Khalis, but it wasn't making any sense. Both Cullinane and Mark Tuohy, who prosecuted the Hanafis, credit three foreign ambassadors with convincing Khalis to surrender something they think would be unlikely to happen in today's political climate. The notion of calling on those wonderful ambassadors from Pakistan and Egypt and Iran today in a situation like this is probably, it's probably so unlikely as, uh, as to be a fantasy. All 12 of the Hanafis were convicted. Khalees died in prison in 2003. Shortly after being shot during those attacks, Marion Barry began organizing his first run for mayor from his hospital bed. In the district, Mark Seagraves, News 4.